The Word of God is rich and full of not only encouragement, but admonitions. God speaks His decisive Word to us so that we can know what we are to be and do and follow with obedience. In the book of Isaiah, there are several woes in which God warns his people. Spurgeon said that a warning from God is better than a welcome from Satan. Hear the word of God. First of all, in the fifth chapter of Isaiah, the 20th and 21st verses, and then a passage from the 45th chapter of Isaiah. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And then the Word of God in the 45th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the ninth verse. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Or shall the handiwork say he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, What are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Let us pray. Almighty God, bless now the interpretation of this word, that we might understand your gracious, caring, loving admonitions to us as to how you want us to live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have you ever told God that he's wrong? Sure, we do it all the time. We do it particularly when we contradict what he's told us is right, and also when we question his management of our lives. When's the last time you told him he was wrong? Oh, we don't stand up in our prayers and shake our fist in his face saying, listen, God, if you're interested, I think you're wrong. And let me point out uh, how I would have ordered all of these uh, rules and regulations. And if I had to manage me, I would have done it uh, very differently. Just want you to know that, God. Now, uh, we don't do that. Our blasphemy takes a much subtler form. We express it in passive resistance. We simply don't do what he's told us to do. Now, if you went to a friend and said, I've got a problem, I need you to help me. And the friend said, after listening, well, I think that probably the best thing to do is the following. And you said, thank you very much. And then you left your friend and didn't do what he advised. What would you be saying to your friend? You would be saying to your friend, you gave me advice, but I think it was wrong. Now, if you went to a doctor, and you said, doctor, I'm, I'm ill. How can I stay alive? And the doctor looked you squarely in the eye and said, do these four things if you want to live. And we leave the office and say, well, I'm not sure he's right. I'll get another opinion. And so you go to another physician, and that physician says, if you want to live, you must do the following four things. Oh. Now, if you refuse to do those four things and laugh all the way to the funeral parlor, chances are you have told both doctors that you uh, didn't think that they were right. 
over and over again in our everyday life. We contradict God, tell him that we would have done it differently. But most of all, when we resist his basic commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the basic way of life that he's revealed to us, we are declaring to him that we think he's wrong. Now, if you have consistently told a person that he is wrong, chances are if you're in a real fix and life has painted you into a corner, chances are you're not going to go to the person you have consistently told is wrong and ask for his advice, or his love, or his guidance. There's been a break because you didn't really believe what he said in the first place. It happens over and over again. We drift away from God by consistently saying no to what he has given us to do and to be. There's no ambiguity about it. And if you believe in the authority of the Scriptures, it's all there. How we are to live in relationship to Him, to ourselves, to other people, and in this sick and suffering world. Now, if we consistently turn away from that, eventually we get into trouble. Someone once asked Henry Thoreau, have you made your peace with God, Henry? And he said, we never quarreled. <laughs> well, I wonder why not. Perhaps uh, he never came to grips with the ultimate authority of God over his life, and therefore there was no reason for a quarrel. But how about your life? How about mine? Do you ever quarrel with God in the way he's ordered things? God spoke to his people through Isaiah at a crucial time in their history, a time of conflict, apostasy, and decline. And at that moment, he said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. It happens again and again. When we take that which is evil and call it good or turn it around, the end result is that what God has declared to be good, we resist, saying, oh, I don't need to do that. And what he has declared evil, and we say, oh, that's not so bad. As a matter of fact, I think it's rather good. The word good is so awesome that we feel we can't attain to it. And we place the word evil in such a dastardly context that we feel we're not that bad. And so we miss resisting the evil that attacks all of us, and we seldom discover the good that God has given for all of us. Hear me, evil is simply this. It's breaking the covenant with God. It's doing things our own way. It's refusing to obey. It's the misery that comes as a result. It's the spiritual pain that infects us and pulsates in our soul. Evil is shaking your fist in the face of God. Now, I've often said that once we turn our lives over to Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We cannot be invaded by the forces of evil. I believe that we can be influenced by evil. And that's the danger. People who believe in Christ can at the same time passively resist what it is that Christ has told us that we must do and be. He's declared the law of love. He's given us the way of forgiveness. 
He's called us to serve and care for each other. He's called us to witness to our faith and multiply our faith by introducing other people to him. He's called us to be servants in society, allowing the plumb line of his justice to fall on anything that is wrong and therefore become involved so that we might be a part of his solution. He's called us to work for justice and righteousness. He has invited us to join with him in changing the world. And yet, very often, we proclaim him Lord and refuse to do the things that he's called us to do. Rather, the things that we determine are best for us, which might be rebellion against him and therefore evil, we say, oh, that's good. It feels good, satisfies me, gives me power. God has given us a way to deal with our money. All through scripture it's declared that God's way for the handling of money is the tithe. And we say, well, that might have been good for those days, but uh, I'll give God what's left when the scripture calls us to give him what comes first. The scriptures clearly declare monogamous marriage as the place where the gift of sexuality is to be expressed in intimacy. And yet, in our society, many Christians are saying, well, you know, the scriptures aren't really authoritative. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. You can do what you want to do with whom you want to do it whenever you want to do it. Just be sure it's safe sex. And a young woman with tears streaming down her face said, he said he loved me. He said he was going to marry me. And she had to make the decision. Would she bear his child, even if she had to put it up for adoption? And then, in the prayers, she sorted out what was evil and what was good. There in the quiet, with God and a gentle, encouraging voice of a pastor, she was able to see the issues that she would not murder the life in her. She would bear that child. And she would give that child to some Christian couple to be raised. And as she walked out of my office, I said, that's good. She didn't take what had been evil, that is, apart from God, rebellion against him, and call it good. But it's the same thing in our relationships. Jesus Christ calls us for forgiveness. We are to be agents of his forgiveness in the midst of a broken world. And yet, often, we carry the heavy impedimenta of all of the memories and hurts of the past. And we say, well, I've gotten so familiar with feeling badly that I'm not sure I want to feel good again. Hmm. And we choose to call resistance to forgiveness good, and it's not good at all. Over and over again, we face human need. We pass it by. We say, you can't care for everything. Well, no, but under the guidance of the Spirit of the Lord, we can care for those things he puts on our agenda. And to refuse is to take the good guidance that he gives us and call it evil. Over and over again, 
God has given us his guidance. We've got the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the message of Jesus Christ. Henrietta Muir said, in discovering the will of God, it's never a question of what God will do. It's a question of what you're going to do. You already know God's will. Now, just get in line and do it. I liked her directness. We all know more about the will of God than we could live out in all of the years of a multiplied lifetime. We need to begin to live out what we already know. People keep asking me, how do you know the will of God? Well, you find the essentials in the Scripture, and you listen to God in prayer. You meet together with people whom you love and who love you and can help you find what it is that God is saying to you. And then you follow through. And as you're obedient with the guidance you get at one stage, God gives you further guidance for the next stage. But if we say no so long that we can't say yes, we commit the unforgivable sin because we block out the influence of the Spirit in our lives. Every moment, the Holy Spirit is impinging upon us, seeking to give us the guidance that we need based on the essential scriptural message. We feel nudgings. We hear the still, small voice within us. And we know what we are to do. So often when we follow those nudgings, wonderful things begin to happen. But you know what it's like to say, oh, how silly, I'm not going to do that. That's not good. And we call the good nudging evil. And we refuse it. The Holy God has a plan for our lives. And not only do we declare him wrong when we resist his guidance, but very often we declare him wrong in the way he's managed our lives. And that leads us to another woe in that 45th chapter of Isaiah, a warning. Woe to you who strive with your maker. It's like clay on a potter's wheel, jumping off the wheel and saying, Potter, what are you doing with me? And we do it all the time. As circumstances evolve, we say, God, I don't think you're right in the way you're working things out for me. And we tell him what he ought to do rather than receiving his power to face the circumstances that life evolves and discover his plan and purpose. Stop telling God that he's wrong. He is right, and he is righteous, and he has a plan and power to live that plan. Blessed are those who hear God and say yes and do his will.